I'm Dr. Ashley DeLeon uh, from the Crane Center for Transgender Surgery. Uh, sorry about any technical difficulties. Um, we are here today to talk about vaginoplasty. Um, I will tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I grew up as a military brat, lived all over the world, ended up uh, going to the University of Kansas uh, to do um, undergraduate and my doctorate in pharmacy. Uh, became a pharmacist after that and moved to Austin, Texas. Um, where I uh, started a graduate school program for mental health outcomes research. Uh, during that period of time, um, I decided I wanted to go back to medical school, uh, so I ended up practicing as a uh, clinical bone marrow and oncology, uh, bone marrow transplant oncology pharmacist, um, as well as a psychiatric pharmacy practice pharmacist um, for a few years, and then ultimately went back to medical school. Uh, fell in love with surgery, um, ended up doing a uh, general surgery and uh, trauma surgery residency uh, here in Austin, Texas. Uh, after the completion of that, I practiced general surgery and trauma here in the Austin area for several years and then uh, ended up um, being introduced to Dr. Crane. Um, we ended up working together and um, initially um, had everything set up to do uh, transgender surgery part-time. Um, but I fell in love with all the procedure, fell in love with the patients, uh, so ultimately gave up uh, my other practice and stopped doing transgender surgery, stopped doing general surgery and trauma surgery, and uh, did a fellowship in transgender surgery with Dr. Crane. And now I do uh, gender affirmation surgeries uh, exclusively and uh, do them full time. So uh, today we are doing questions for vaginoplasty. If anybody has questions out there, and I'll forget all the technical difficulties, um, be sure to uh, message them, and I'll um, answer as many as I have time for. Um, and I have a list of questions that have been messaged in advance um, from patients that I will uh, start with, and we will uh, go from there. So, first question is. Um, what can I expect in my vaginoplasty consultation? Um, okay, so for um, a vaginoplasty consultation, uh, the uh, surgeon, whichever surgeon you may be working with, is uh, first gonna want to get a full history, um, and depending on whether you're doing this via phone or in person, uh, physical exam, uh, to get just more information about you, make sure you're uh, safe to undergo a, a surgical procedure, etc. Um, we will also, um, at our practice here, we will have you watch a video um, that goes through all of the basic information about the uh, vaginoplasty procedure, taking you kind of from start to finish, all the way from you know letters and preoperative information, hair removal, all the way out to the, the surgical procedure, the complications you may experience um, from any surgical procedure, all the way out to recovery and long-term information and long-term data. Um, and that is all discussed in the initial operation. Um, we typically will have you watch the video first. Um, I feel like that's really helpful for patients because then they can um, come, you know, most of our patients have researched this procedure for years on end and um, can educate me about many things. Um, but um, regardless, it's nice to have that video to go through some of the basics, some of the um, information that way um, at the time of your consultation um, we are both on the same page and that way you can utilize that time um, to ask any specific um, questions or voice any concerns um, that you may have so um, other than that um, the that's the kind of that's the kind of the crux of the vaginoplasty consultation is really just a time for you to ask questions um, the next question, how much say do I have in the look of my new vagina? So, a um, couple things. Um, first of all, when you look at any vagina, cis female, trans female, um, you name it, there's no such thing as a perfect vagina. Um, everybody's vagina is different um, in cis women and in trans women. Um, so. Um, the look of your new vagina um, is going to depend primarily on um, what anatomy we're starting with um, and then how you heal. Those are the main two components that really go into creating a, uh, to creating a vagina and, and performing the vaginoplasty procedure. Um, the 
obviously the external look um, should look natural. Um, you should have Lady Majora, Lady Lenora, you should have Clitoris, you should have a prepuce, which is the clitoral hood. Um, you should have a uh, vaginal canal that's functional, um, uh, so forth and so on. A vestibule, which is the uh, mucosal area. Mucosa is like the inside lining of your uh, cheek um, between your labia minora. Um, so those are all kind of the standard goals of the vaginoplasty procedure. Now, how um, prominent your labia majora are, how prominent your labia minora are, those kinds of things are more based on anatomy. Um, it depends on how much soft tissue you, ha you have, how much skin laxity you have, um, and then the, the other component of that is just how you heal. Um, you know, how you scar, how your scars mature, um, how your collagen turns over in the wound bed, um, all those kinds of things kind of come into what your final result is, which we typically don't see until about nine months to a year after the surgical procedure um, is when we, we see where everything's kind of settling out. Um, that being said, um, of course there are, you know, some preferences that patients may have of, you know, I, I would like to have large labia majora or labia minora, or maybe I just want to be, um, you know, much smaller and, and closer into the to the pubic bones um, as far as the the labia and the laxity is concerned um, that type of stuff just depending on the anatomy sometimes we have some wiggle room with um, and can alter the size of the, the size of the clitoris is another um, you know thing that we can alter a little bit um, I will tell you that typically we are going to make the clitoris a little bit bigger than what you would want um, but make no mistake, it's purposeful um, because we want you to have good sensation and the clitoris almost always after the surgical procedure will atrophy, which means it gets smaller. Um, and we cannot add to the clitoris. The clitoris actually has erectile tissue, it has erogenous sensation, it has everything we need to give you good sensation and good erotic sensation and orgasms after vaginoplasty. So we don't alter that. However, um, we want to make sure that when it atrophies or becomes smaller as it's healing, that it doesn't disappear. Um, so we tend to favor uh, making them a little bit larger initially because they typically are going to heal and become smaller over time and end up kind of right in the range where you would um, want as far as a, you know size considerations. Um, and the good thing is, is if for some reason um, a patient doesn't atrophy as much as we expect. And so maybe they have kind of a bulbous, more prominent clitoris um, that they're not happy with. Well, then there's two things that we um, can do, um, you know, from the revision side of things. Um, we can make the clitoris smaller. That's a very easy, quick operation. And we can create a more prominent clitoral hood um, or prepuce, um, which is also a very quick, easy, and simple operation um, for us that we offer even here in the office. Um, so for those reasons, we typically favor on the larger side and let it become smaller as it should. Um, and then again, as far as the labia are concerned, we can, we have a little bit of wiggle room, um, that we can manipulate with that, but ultimately the majority of it is based on, um, anatomy and healing. Um, what is the recovery like after vaginoplasty? So for the first five to seven days after vaginoplasty, if you're doing the full one stage penile inversion vaginoplasty, um, when you wake up from surgery, um, there will be vaginal packing within the vaginal canal, uh, which is gonna create a sensation of pressure um, on both the rectum down below, which makes you feel like you have to have a bowel movement even though you don't, um, and then also puts pressure on the bladder and urethra up above, which can make you feel like you have to urinate when you don't. It's also comp compounded by the fact that you have a Foley catheter in your bladder, which also causes that sensation. Um, most of the time that gets better after about the first 24 hours, um, but some patients are more sensitive than others. Um, and then on top of that, you'll have a Foley catheter in the bladder um, so that um, your urine is being emptied into a bag. And then there will also be a bolster dressing sutured in place um, to give compression to the labia majora and labia minora, and also down below to help hold that packing in the vaginal canal so that it doesn't come out when you wake up from anesthesia and your muscles become activated again and you start mobilizing. Um, that bolster dressing, the vaginal packing, and the Foley catheter are all going to stay in place for those first five to seven days after surgery, which is why we don't, um, you can't get your pelvis wet at all because of the graft that's in the vaginal canal. Um, but you can sponge bathe, you can wash your hair in the sink. But again, it's not the most glamorous time. Um, you're going to be attached to, you know, a catheter bag. 
um, you know, won't be able to shower, going to have pressure. Um, and so really that first five to seven days, um, in my opinion, is kind of the biggest um, mountain to kind of get over. Um, after that, when you have your first post-op visit, um, it's usually very free. Um, we take everything out, the, the bolster dressing comes off, the vaginal packing comes out of the canal, the, the Foley catheter comes out of your bladder so you can sit down and urinate, um, and we give you your dilator kit and actually physically show you um, how to do dilations with the dilator kit that we provide and a water-based lubricant. Um, we also have you demonstrate dilations so that we know you're comfortable um, with that maneuver. Um, and then you are able to go home after that appointment and shower, um, which is, is nice, obviously, after surgery. Um, from that point forward, from that first post-op visit, um, it's, it's more about learning how to do your dilation, seeing what works for you, um, you know, learning how to clean out the vaginal canal, um, and, and things such as that. So for the activity restrictions, um, we just don't want you doing anything strenuous or doing any heavy lifting, anything over about 10, 20 pounds for about eight weeks after vaginoplasty because there's just a lot of healing to do. Um, it's a big operation. Um, so most of my patients take anywhere from four to eight weeks off work depending on what they do and what their activity level is at work. Um, and also depending on whether um, they have the ability at their work to take breaks to do their dilations. Um, dilations will be three times a day for 10 to 15 minutes for that first three months. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind from a timing perspective. And from a work perspective, um, if you're planning to return a little sooner, I would say um, my patients that return to work four weeks after, um, that's more than probably what I would do. Um, but the, uh, so most of my patients are about six to eight work, six to eight weeks out of work. Um, once you, you know, hit the eight week mark. So basically from that first post-op visit until about the eight week mark, eight week mark or six week mark, depending on how you're healing and if you're going back to work and, and so forth. Um, you're, you're dilating three times a day for 10 to 15 minutes. You're showering only, uh, no baths, pools, hot tubs, lakes, rivers, anything like that because of the risk of an infection. Um, and just kind of learning to, you know, deal with the new, um, the new uh, surgical site. After that, um, things get more normalized um, as far as your day-to-day -day activities. Um, I will say that otherwise activity restrictions um, are still in place that are specifically dedicated to the pelvis um, that last a little bit longer. Um, by about six months, um, most of any kind of chronic pain, nerve pain, things like that, drainage, bleeding, all that kind of stuff is improving significantly, um, if not gone completely. Um, and then once you reach about nine to 12 months, that's when you're really kind of hitting your stride. That's where you're gonna have your final um, cosmetic results as far as scar maturation is concerned, um, where that's where the, the scars along the labia are gonna really thin, they're gonna soften, they're gonna flatten, they're gonna lighten um, so that they're not very apparent at all. The good thing about this operation is this area heals very well typically, um, and so the scars are even though there are certainly scars, um, they're very uh, minimal as far as visibility is concerned. Um, and so that's typically gonna be around that nine to 12 month window. Um, same situation um, when we talk about sensation, which I think, if I remember correctly, somebody also asked a specific question about, so we'll um, get to that in a moment. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of about how the first year lays out. Um, you know, barring there's no complications or other issues that need to be addressed. Um, after vaginoplasty. Um, next question. I have a lot of anxiety about my upcoming surgery. Is this normal? Any suggestions for minimizing? So, um, prior to any surgical procedure, um, it's very normal to um, experience anxiety, stress, um, wondering what's going to happen. Um, Honestly, most of my patients, um, when they're very anxious about surgery, um, it's typically um, my patients that have never had surgery before, um, which we obviously operate on a lot of very young, healthy patients, so that makes sense. Um, and then the other piece of that is um, a, most of my patients, their anxiety, what I've kind of realized it's stemming from isn't so much um, the technical aspects of the surgery, 
um, or you know complications, but more so um, worried about general anesthesia, um, especially if they haven't had general anesthesia before. Um, so first and foremost, it's normal to be anxious before surgery. I'm a surgeon, I even get anxious before I have surgery. Um, it's kind of part of the process. So um, speaking to your counselor, your therapist, um, if you already have an underlying uh, generalized anxiety disorder that you take anxiolytics for, um, that may be helpful um, as well during this time period. Um, but it is normal, I wanna stress that. Um, uh, minimizing it, um, it's hard, but obviously, you know, talking to your friends, your family, maybe talking to um, a support group and other um, transgender patients who've already gone through the procedure um, and to have that kind of experience to share with you can sometimes be helpful in mitigating um, and minimizing some of that anxiety. Um, and then also, um, what I tell my patients when they ask about general anesthesia, since that tends to be um, the thing that most of my patients seem to be the most anxious about, um, who haven't had it before, it is, um, it, it's truly um, a situation um, where we have perfected um, general anesthesia so much, um, and the anesthesiologists are so good, um, that you remember having an oxygen mask on your face in the operating room and kind of counting down, they make a countdown from 10, and then the next thing you know, you blink your eyes and you open them. And when you open them, you're in the recovery room. Um, it's a very surreal experience, um, but it, it does exactly what um, the purpose is, which is you are completely asleep, you're unaware of what's happening, there's no pain, there's no discomfort, there's no distress. Um, and it's, it's such a surreal experience that when patients open their eyes in the recovery room, they, they don't even believe that the surgery's already finished. Because um, how could it be? They just blink their eyes. Um, and that's, um, that is kind of the crux of general anesthesia um, and why it's a beautiful thing. Um, so uh, that's typically what I share with my patients before surgery who are nervous about general anesthesia uh, because it is, um, it's gonna keep you comfortable and asleep throughout the operation and keep your pain controlled. Um, next question, um, when can I have penetrative sex? Uh, penetrative sex, so um, for most activities after vaginoplasty, we do a uh, time limit of eight weeks. Um, that's the answer for most things after vaginoplasty. Um, the exception is for penetrative intercourse. Um, for penetrative intercourse, we uh, recommend you wait a total of 12 weeks after vaginoplasty um, to let that uh, skin graft and flap, that's lining the new vaginal canal, fully heal um, prior to introducing anything other than water-based lubricant and your dilator into the canal. Um, so 12 weeks for that. Also, I should mention, even though it wasn't asked, um, is that the other activities that we really recommend you wait a full 12 weeks or three months for um, after vaginoplasty also includes anything that's really specifically dedicated to the pelvis. Best example I can think of is riding a bicycle. Because um, when you ride a bicycle, the seat and the way the seat is shaped and how you're sitting on the seat, you're completely sitting on all your suture lines at the surgical site um, and then moving your legs back and forth, which is, is putting stress and tension on those new, um, those new suture lines. Um, anytime you put stress on a fresh incision, it can make you scar wider or have um, other complications. Um, and so for that reason, for you know things like riding a bicycle, penetrative intercourse, and stuff like that, we recommend you wait 12 weeks before you do any of those activities. Um, then that, there was a follow-up to that one that says, how about oral sex? Um, oral sex after um, vaginoplasty, I typically tell my patients 12 weeks for that as well um, for different reasons. Um, the uh, the actual physical activity or the mechanics of it um, doesn't really put stress on the surgical site um, like penetrative intercourse or a bicycle would um, but because humans mouths are not the cleanest thing in the world we harbor a lot of bacteria in our mouths um, that are part of our normal healthy flora but that may not be the best thing for um, fresh incisions and suture lines um, and because in this operation there's so much tissue rearrangement, there's so much swelling um, and other things that go into play, it takes a while to heal from. Um, and the last thing we would want is um, to be, uh, to have an infection that far out from surgery and that far out of the gate. So I usually tell my patients 
just to be safe. Um, for oral sex, I would also wait 12 weeks to where you make sure everything's completely healed. You have a good skin barrier um, or mucosal barrier, um, depending on which area you're talking about over everything so that you don't set yourself up um, for an infection and for complications. Um, next question, what is your most common complication and how do you address it? So, for most common complication, there's really two, um, in my opinion, um, after vaginoplasty that are fairly common. Um, one of them is to have some uh, breakdown or separation of the suture line um, after a week or two out from surgery when you started your dilations. Um, the most common spot I see it is right along that, uh, the, if you were laying on a bed, the bottom portion, so posterior in my world, um, in your world, uh, the, the spot closer towards your anus, that part um, of the suture line that you'll see um, at the opening of your introitus, which is the opening to your new vaginal canal that was created, that suture line right under there is under the greatest amount of tension, okay? Because we're taking all this tissue and skin and we're pulling it down, um, I don't even know if y'all can see me, but we're pulling all the skin and excess tissue down and then suturing together there. That's what's going to create the labia majora um, and help us to um, have enough tissue to create the labia minora as well. Um, and so because any time a incision line is under tension, um, then it's at risk for separating. Um, and so that's why that area is most frequently uh, the suture lines that get disrupted. Um, in addition to that, literally five to seven days after surgery, we're asking you to dilate past that suture line. Um, so it's kind of adding insult to injury. So if anything is going to kind of break down or open or separate, that's going to be the most common spot. Um, I would say overall in our practice, it's about 20%. Um, so 80% of the time, there's no breakdown, there's no issues, about 20% of the time, which is, you know, a lot for a, um, you know, a high number for, um, you know, when you're talking about complications. Um, the good thing is, um, once that happens, I have never had to take a patient back to the operating room, I've never had to fix anything, and I've never had an issue um, with the following cosmetic result um, at the end of that year. Um, the downside is that if that happens and you have any kind of wound breakdown or suture separation under there on that underside of the opening to your vaginal canal, um, it's just any time that happens, we can't close it. Once the skin's open, it's open, it's exposed to bacteria. If we were to close it at that point, what that does is it closes in the bacteria and that's what forms an abscess and bigger problems. So what we do is we leave it open and then you have to heal in from the ground up and let the skin grow over it. And at the end of the day, you would never know it was there. Everything heals fine. Um, but what it means to the patients is that you may have a little bit of an open wound for longer. You may have to delay going out to the lake or something like that where there's you know, a risk of freshwater infections and things like that um, for a little bit longer if you have any type of um, wound breakdown um, in that area. So that's probably the most common complication that I see after vaginoplasty. The other one, I know I mentioned too, um, that's fairly common is hypergranulation tissue, um, which is just a fancy word for wound healing tissue that your body is producing in excess. Um, what it looks like, it looks like a um, kind of like a beefy red cauliflower -y type tissue or growth almost um, that you can see. I most commonly see it right around your clitoris. Um, you can also see it like within the vaginal canal um, and really anywhere um, you have surgery, but especially around the clitoris is the most common spot that I see it. Um, it's not dangerous, it's not scary, um, but it's, uh, you know, you can see it, it's visible, um, and it tends to kind of weep, or um, which means uh, kind of lets small amounts of fluid out, kind of oozy. Um, and it also, can, it's very friable, which means if you bump it or hit it or knock it, um, it can also kind of bleed. Um, so between the fluid and the bleeding and then just the appearance of having that kind of beefy rat, red kind of cauliflower tissue there, um, that's common. Um, I don't know the percentage on that, but it's probably somewhere around the same as the wound breakdowns. So probably around somewhere like 20%. So definitely one of the most common things we see after this operation. Again, good news about that, similar to the other one we discussed, um, is that it's not um, anything bad or scary. It's just your body producing 
wound healing tissue and just being too good at it. Um, and the way we treat it, uh, most of the time by three months, um, most of that has regressed and gone away and the body is taking care of it all by itself. Um, if that's not the case and you have persistent hypergranulation tissue, um, then the way we treat it is with um, silver nitrate sticks, um, which produces a chemical cautery. So in other words, we use a chemical silver nitrate um, to burn um, that tissue. And I say the word burn, I'm sure a million of y'all have cringed. Um, it doesn't hurt, I've used it on myself. Um, it, it doesn't sting, it doesn't hurt, it's just excess wound healing tissue, so it's not sensate, meaning it doesn't have nerve endings. Um, it's very comfortable, we do it here in the office, it takes about 60 seconds, and um, you don't feel anything. Um, the downside being, sometimes we have to do that multiple times to finally get rid of it, um, but ultimately, pretty easily treatable, easily treatable complication. Um, what is dilation and why is it important? So for the one stage penile and virgin vaginoplasty, um, the vaginal canal that we create is lined with skin. Um, so that means it's we use the skin from the shaft of the penis and the skin from the scrotum. Um, when we line anything with skin, um, it wants to, the body wants to heal and close down. Um, meaning that space that we're creating um, between the rectum below and the urethra and bladder above, these, these structures are literally like a few millimeters away. Um, so we're creating a space in between those structures uh, without injuring those structures um, to create a good anatomic vaginal canal that's where it should be. Um, when we do that, then as I mentioned, we take the skin from the, the penis and we take the skin from the scrotum and we use that to, to line that entire canal. Um, so because of that, especially during the first year after surgery, and really especially after the first like three months, um, your body is in heal mode. Um, your body does not recognize um, what we just did um, and instead thinks it's a surgical wound that needs to be shut and be healed. So it's just the body's natural instinct to try to heal everything closed. Um, and so because of that, that's why dilations are super important. Um, we start them about five to seven days after the initial surgery. Again, I mentioned, I think previously that we give you the dilator kit here. We show you how to do it. We have you demonstrate it. Um, it's not painful. Um, typically, it may create a sensation of pressure or discomfort, um, but it's not like a sharp pain or um, or anything that's too uncomfortable for patients uh, to endure after surgery. What I always tell my patients to do is watch something on television that's completely vapid. So you don't want to laugh a ton. You don't want to be nervous or tense because anytime you do that and you tense up your pelvic floor muscles, you can push the dilator out. Um, so just watch something mindless. Um, I call it trash TV. Just watch trash TV um, and veg out. And once you get the dilator inserted, you keep it in for you know 10 to 15 minutes for three times a day for those first three months. We have a schedule that we provide you that tapers off after that so that by the time the year is out, um, most of my patients are dilating about once a week. Um, so it becomes much less onerous over time. Um, but um, the purpose is to keep the canal open because as I mentioned before, it wants to close down. That's what it wants to do. Um, and um, so the, the importance of it though um, is that the only real big complication, let me back up. So the big complication you can have in this operation is actually injuring the rectum, urethra, or bladder. Those are the big complications. Um, and those require much more surgery to fix and correct. Fortunately, it's never happened to me before, but it can. Um, and, um, but the other complication that we can face, I guess I should say the biggest complication that we can face long term. Um, so in other words, vaginoplasty goes fine, there's no complications, you heal well, everything's going great. Um, let's say six months after vaginoplasty, um, everything's going awesome and maybe um, you know, something changes within your, um, you know, your social situation or your mental health situation. Maybe you become depressed. Maybe you don't feel like dilating. Maybe you don't, you know, who knows? There's a million reasons why um, patients stop dilating. 
if you stop dilating, I forget to tell you, your canal will close. Um, the body does amazing things and it will heal it shut. Um, if that happens, and the reason it's such a big deal, um, this operation, is if your canal shuts and closes down, it's, you know, skin on skin, it's closed, there's no space there anymore, you can't dilate, um, and you don't have a canal that's functional. Um, if that happens, um, I have had patients that I've taken back to the operating room, I've reopened their canal for them. Um, I will mention that if, if that were to happen, anytime we go back to reopen a canal after it's already been operated on, um, it's a higher risk for those other complications that I mentioned before. So injuring the rectum, the bladder, and the urethra. Um, you're at higher risk for those complications um, after we are doing a redo operation. And that's because there's now scar in that in that plane so it's not fresh you know tissue that we're working through um, just with all those important structures millimeters away from us instead um, it's all scarred down um, and everything's kind of stuck to itself um, and so it's a higher risk for injury um, if you do a redo canal um, again fortunately I haven't had that happen to me yet when I've redone people's canals but it can happen and it's a much higher risk um, and then in addition to that um, what we can do when we recreate your canal, think we're recreating a new opening. So we need something to line the canal with, right? So um, what I typically will do as a first maneuver, um, if somebody loses their canal, is do a dilation under anesthesia. Okay, that's the first step. So if we dilate under anesthesia, that way it's not so painful. Um, sometimes that's enough if the patient keeps up with dilations afterwards um, to keep everything open and everybody's happy. If that doesn't work, then we're talking about recreating the canal. Um, if you have complete vaginal stenosis from not dilating, meaning the whole thing is shut down. Um, if that happens um, and I recreate the canal, then we have to figure out something to line it with. Um, so what I'll typically do is my first maneuver um, is also use skin um, to dilate, um, skin to line the canal for the redo um, with the caveat being um, that, remember, that canal is filled with scar. Scar doesn't have a blood supply. It's very important for a skin graft, which is what we're using when we line a canal with skin, um, is it has to pick up blood supply from the surrounding tissue in order to survive. Um, and so there's a much lower risk of that being successful um, after we're recreating the canal for you because there's tons of scar in that area. So we, when we have no control over that and how much blood supply is available um, to support a new skin graft into the canal. Um, so we uh, typically will use either skin from the abdomen. Um, it's almost like a mini tummy tuck. Um, and we can also use skin under the, uh, the buttock creases on your uh, backside um, that can be kind of hidden within that gluteal cleft um, and um, you know I've had success with that working for redo canals uh, but the reality is is it's not a hundred percent successful um, because of the blood supply issue since it's a redo canal um, and if that's the case then the next step um, we're talking about you know using small bowel colon peritoneum and things of that nature to reconstruct um, and create a new vaginal canal for you that's functional so that's a really long way answer but that's basically why um, the dilations are so so important um, after the one stage beyond virgin vaginoplasty. Why must I stop taking hormones before my surgery? So we try our best not to stop hormones completely because we know that's miserable. Um, so let's talk about there's basically three different classes of hormones um, that trans women are using um, there is androgen blockers um, which is going to be like your spironolactone sometimes patients are on finasteride things of that nature um, that's all aimed at blocking the effects of androgens or testosterone in other words on um, our on our bodies um, there's also progesterone and then estradiol or estrogen based um, components of many different formulations. Okay, so for androgen blockers, so spironolactone, finasteride, that kind of stuff, um, we allow you to take that all the way up until the time of surgery. Um, there's no problem with doing that. Um, after surgery, you don't need it anymore. You can throw it away because we are performing an orchiectomy, which means we're removing the testicles. If you remove the testicles, you're removing the main, the body's main production of testosterone. 
um, the only androgens and testosterone that you're going to produce otherwise is going to be in your adrenal glands that any human on earth uh, produces, okay? So um, once we remove the testicles, that testosterone level is going to plummet and you're not going to need those medications anymore, but we have no problems with you taking them all the way up into the sign of surgery. It doesn't really affect anything. Um, for estradiol um, and progesterone, for estradiol, what we would prefer is if you can be at four milligrams a day if you're taking the pills. If you're taking the pills and let's say you're on eight milligrams a day, let's say you take four in the morning and four in the evening and you're on a total of eight milligrams of estrogen pills, um, what we'll ask you to do is one to two weeks before surgery, cut that down to four milligrams total dose for the day, so maybe two in the morning, two in the evening, um, and leave yourself at that dose um, until a week after surgery. A week after surgery, so in other words, when you're coming back in for your first post-op visit to get the vaginal packing out, the bolster dressings off, the Foley catheter out, at that point, um, you can go back to your previous dose um, of estrogen, but by allowing you to stay on that four milligrams a day, um, it really helps with mood stabilization and other things like that. So um, that's why we do that. And then progesterone, progesterone we just ask a week before and a week after, no progesterone um, throughout the perioperative period, which means around the time of surgery. Um, and the reason for the estradiol and the progesterone, lowering the estrogen dose and taking you off the progesterone, um, if you're on progesterone for that you know, kind of two week period, um, is because we do not want you to get blood clots. Um, they predispose you and increase your risk of developing a blood clot um, after surgery, and that is also then coupled and compounded with the risk um, of your body undergoing just the, just the stressor of surgery, being in bed more often, not walking as frequently, all those kinds of things are going to predispose you to blood clots. Um, and then if you compound that with the hormones, um, then you're you know talking about a more uh, a less negligible risk um, of developing a blood clot. So. Um, so that's why we alter your hormones a little bit around the time of surgery. Again, um, trying to keep you on as much as we possibly can, um, but that's still safe for you to undergo surgery and not have um, any post-operative complications. What determines the depth of my vaginal cavity? So for the vaginal canal, we uh, all of our vaginal canals um, here at the Brain Center for Training transgender surgery are between 12 to 15 centimeters so that's somewhere between um, you know five to six six and a half inches um, somewhere around there um, two reasons uh, first reason that is the average length or depth of a cis female's vaginal canal um, as well as the average length of a cis male's penis um, despite what they may tell you um, or what they think, um, but that is the kind of average overall for all of our human anatomy. Um, so that's why we strive to achieve those depths. Um, the other component of that is um, I've had people tell me that um, some surgeons go for 20 centimeters. Um, more isn't necessarily better. Um, once you, the way the the space that the vaginal canal is created in and the space of a cis female's vagina, um, it's the same. Um, it's, you know, the first part is not within the abdominal cavity. It's external, right? It's, it's within the soft tissues in the pelvis. Um, but once you get higher up into the body, so in other words, getting deeper, um, then you're actually within the intra-abdominal cavity. And so if you're making canals routinely longer than 15 centimeters, um, what can happen is the small intestine colon, blood, all those kinds of things can fall into the vaginal canal that you're creating, um, which can be problematic. Um, so we always stop at 15 centimeters because um, there's really no reason to make it any any longer or any deeper because um, then you're just risking injury and you're superseding what all humans have averagely anyways. Um, so yeah, 12 to 15 centimeters. Um, how can I know if the skin of my penis and scrotum are sufficient to avoid a skin graft? This is a good question. Um, a lot of my patients who um, have been on, testo or on testosterone blockers and things like puberty blockers and things like that from when they were young, um, anytime you're doing that um, and you don't have enough testosterone production that's being active within your body, um, it can cause atrophy 
which again, when we talk about clitoris, kind of similar thing, atrophy meaning shrinkage or you know less tissue. Um, and it can cause that for both the penis and the testicles. Um, and so that's why this question comes up. Um, and so I, if there is any concern, um, what I would tell you is you should definitely um, let your surgeon know there's a concern so that they can examine you and see how much tissue they have to work with. Um, I have not yet, um, in the years that I've been doing vaginoplasty, I have not had a patient where I could not um, make it work with what they had anatomically, um, if that makes sense. Um, so, um, because we, we're, we're combining two different things um, to line the canal. So we have the skin from the shaft of the penis um, that's, that's put in the vaginal canal as a flap, not as a graft, which means um, it's bringing its blood supply with it, right? So we're not thinning it or doing that business. We're bringing it in with its own blood supply and, and lining the first part of the vaginal canal with that. The deeper part of the vaginal canal is where that the graft portion comes into it, which means this is, and this is the scrotal skin that I'm talking about. The scrotal skin comes off, it gets completely thinned so that it can be used as a skin graft, um, and that gets sewn onto the top of the, um, the penile, the skin from the, the shaft of the penis, um, so that you have a blind pouch that ends up getting, and, and we have cartoons of this operation and it really doesn't show this well. Um, but when you have that hollow skin tube that was from the shaft of the penis, um, then we're taking that skin graft from the scrotum and we're sewing it on top, right? So then you have this big blind pouch and we invert it so that once we put it into the vaginal canal, the skin's on the inside of the canal lining, um, lining the area. So, um, so that's what we're using the skin for, and so that's where that question comes into play because some patients who have been on blockers um, for years um, have atrophy of both the shaft of the penis, meaning we have less skin tube to work with um, for the flat portion of the lining. Um, and then if their uh, testicles atrophy, that can also actually cause the scrotal skin to con con kind of contract and be smaller. Um, and if that happens, we don't have a ton of tissue or skin to work with as far as the lining of the canal is concerned. Um, again, I have never had a patient that I was not able to make it work um, in one, some form or fashion um, to give them still a good 12 to 15 centimeter vaginal canal. Um, but if there's any concerns at all, you should definitely let your surgeon know that you're concerned that you have enough tissue that will examine you um, and they should be able to tell just by examining you whether they're going to be okay or not. Um, should it become an issue um, and you know, the sur say the surgeon looks and says, oh yeah, I mean there's just really you know, not enough skin here to utilize to give you a full um, vaginal canal. In that case, what I would recommend um, is that you um, uh, allow the surgeon to use skin from somewhere else. In other words, um, kind of like we talked about when you do a redo vaginal canal for somebody who has complete vaginal stenosis, um, then we can use skin from the abdomen, you can skin from the bilateral, from both you know, buttocks, from the backside, um, any of those areas um, are fine to harvest skin from to use to line the vaginal canal. Um, that can be done during the initial operation if there's not enough tissue to work with. Um, however, again, I haven't had that be a problem yet. Um, but should it become a problem, then that's what I would do is just consent them to use skin from somewhere else of their choosing um, and use that to line the canal and it shouldn't be a problem. Do I need laser hair removal or electrolysis to remove hair on my scrotum? This is this is actually an interesting question because um, we were uh, just in Dallas a few months ago at the uh, the American Electrology Association, uh, their national annual meeting um, in Dallas, and I did a two-hour lecture on um, hair removal in transgender patients. Um, and um, do you need hair removal or laser hair removal or electrolysis? Okay, well, first of all, for laser hair removal versus electrolysis, um, I leave that up to the hair removal specialist to decide what's best for you. But what I can tell you just in general terms um, is that uh, both of them take several treatments um, and for different reasons. But basically, laser hair removal, um, you have to be a good candidate for laser hair removal in order to have a good result. Um, somebody like me, who's super super light skinned and, and kind of pasty um, and has really dark hair follicles, um, I'm a good candidate for laser. The reason is because the laser targets the pigment um, and it just it sees pigment. That's what it sees. Um, and so if you have really dark skin, 
there's other lasers like YAG lasers and things like that that can help with that. But ultimately, if you have like really dark skin, um, it's just harder for that laser to target the follicle itself, the hair follicle, because it's also seeing melanin and pigment elsewhere in the skin. Um, and the flip side of that too is that if you have really light hair, if you're platinum blonde naturally, for example, and you know not dark, um, then there's nothing for the laser to target. They don't, see, the, the laser can't see that pigment in the hair follicle because it doesn't exist. Um, and so in that case, those patients really, you know, red hair, blonde hair, dark dark skin, you know, if you don't have a Liag laser and things like that, um, those are going to be best for electrolysis. Um, for electrolysis, you're actually going through and individually hitting each hair follicle in destroying it. Um, and so the reason that electrolysis takes several treatments is because you have to, um, you know, hit certain areas um, and you only have so much time and so much patient discomfort um, to get through it. And so um, it's more working on a small area and then coming back and working on another small area or coming back and working on another small area. Whereas for laser, you're hitting the whole area every time, but you're waiting for those hair follicles to wake up and start cycling in their growth cycle so that the laser can see it. Um, and so either way, nine to 18 months in advance is what we recommend. We have a diagram um, that we provide to you in our office, and I'm sure all transgender surgeons do, um, that kind of tells you the area in general that you need to be targeting for hair removal prior to vaginoplasty, um, which is gonna be a circumferential area around the base of the, of the penis, the shaft of the penis, the scrotum, and then a little strip, about a, you know, a two-inch strip down the perineum, um, which is the area um, that's kind of from the uh, base of the scrotum them down to the anus um, and so the reason is because all of those areas are either going to become one of two things they're going to become invaginated into the vaginal canal as the new lining um, like we talked about with the skin especially the scrotum um, the scrotal skin and the skin from the shaft of the penis um, those areas for sure they're going in the canal okay and once they're in the canal you can't access them anymore and you don't want to have hair in the vaginal canal um, the other areas also can become incorporated in part of the labia minora, um, which are normally very thin mucosal structures, meaning like the lining of your, your mouth or your rectum. Um, and so um, for those areas, it's also not ideal to have hair. So that's why we have the diagram the way it is. That's why we recommend you start nine to 18 months in advance. Um, that being said, um, I do have patients that for either pain, uh, pain issues, financial issues, uh, or just dysphoria issues um, have trouble um, complying with hair removal process. Um, I've never turned a patient down for not having hair removal, but I will tell you, um, if you do not have hair removal before and you end up with significant amounts of hair in the vaginal canal, again, no hair removal is permanent. No matter what an electrologist or a laser hair removal specialist tells you, none of it's permanent and perfect. It's just not how it works. But um, it's it's very effective at significantly reducing the amount of hair follicles and only letting what's called vellus hair, um, you know, kind of last, which is the real soft kind of baby, blonde baby hairs that you, you know, have on your face and everywhere else. Um, and that's not as big of a problem, but the nice, the coarse hairs, um, the dark hairs and things like that, um, they are more prone to um, getting inflammation of that hair follicle, um, which is called folliculitis, and that can then lead to a subsequent, like a further infection um, within the vaginal canal, which can be problematic. Um, so that's why we recommend you doing uh, hair removal prior to surgery because that's the most effective way to do it. Um, but it is not mandated, but it's very highly recommended. Um, did I even answer that question? Uh, do I need laser hair removal or electrolysis to remove hair on my scrotum? I did, okay. Oh, and this one said scrotum though, so I guess I should also tell you. Um, what you'll probably hear um, if you do consultations with um, other surgeons and whatnot that they do follicle scraping um, on the scrotal skin. Fair. Um, so it's a skin graft. So anytime we have a skin graft, we, you have to thin a skin graft. It's almost paper thin. I can literally take the skin from somebody's scrotum after we thin it, hold it up to the light, and you can almost read the newspaper through it. That's how thin it has to be in order to survive, in order for it to take up blood supply from the surrounding tissues and live and last and give you a good canal lining. Um, and that's how it is for any skin graft anywhere on your entire body. Um, and so does it disrupt and destroy the hair follicles as we thin the graft because we have to from a medical standpoint and a surgical standpoint? Yes, absolutely. We destroy a lot of the hair follicles all by ourselves when we're thinning the graft. Um, but it's not as effective and it's not as efficient as doing it preoperatively by laser or electrolysis, which is why we still recommend doing that. All right.
if hair grows in my vagina after surgery, how do I remove it? Um, so once there's hair growth within the vaginal canal, it's, it's, it's a, it's a crevice. It's a, you know, it's a hole. So we can't get to it. The laser hair removal specialists can't get to it. The electrolysis specialists or electrologists, um, they can't get to it either. So once it's there, it's there, um, which is again, why we recommend doing it before surgery because it's more efficient that way. Um, however, if somebody has um, recurring hair within the vaginal canal, that's either creating problems or they just don't like from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, what we recommend is um, using Nair um, you can actually squirt um, some nair into the vaginal canal, let it sit for a few minutes based on the directions on the back of the bottle, um, and then rinse it out um, to make sure you don't get a chemical burn um, on the skin. Uh, it's not permanent, you'll have to do it repeatedly, uh, but that's the only way um, we've come up with to how to combat you know, having hair in the vaginal canal after surgery. Is my prostate removed? No. I get this question a lot. Um, prostate is not removed during vaginoplasty. Um, doing a full prostatectomy, which means uh, removal of the prostate, it's a very involved and very invasive procedure. Um, there are a lot of risks associated with it, um, and so um, it is, you know, anytime we operate on somebody or do a surgical procedure, it's always about the risk and benefit ratio um, for that patient. Um, there, the risk far outweighs the benefit of removing a perfectly healthy prostate from a patient prior to vaginoplasty, so we do not do that routinely. Um, nobody does in our country. Um, so no, your prostate will not be removed. You will still have your prostate. Um, I, what I will tell you though, um, in, in, re in relation to that, because I also get asked um, in regards to the prostate, um, what do I do as far as, you know, do I need to worry about screening? Um, you know, moving forward for prostate cancer um, and things like that. So the, the short and long of it is yes, um, you still have a prostate, so you still need to do your normal screening and monitoring for prostate cancer. Um, the, uh, the good news is, is uh, to do a prostate exam um, in a vaginoplasty patient, it's actually transvaginal, um, meaning it's not rectal, it's a vaginal prostate exam because of the, where the prostate's located in relation to the vaginal canal. Um, so that is how you would actually perform a uh, prostate exam. So you need to let whatever urologist or you know whoever know um, that you were transgender, so that they could do the exam properly. Um, and they can also, of course, do all the normal labs, so forth and so on. So a question I also get is: um, Is prostate cancer possible or common after vaginoplasty? So um, the short answer is no. It's decidedly uncommon after vaginoplasty. Um, because um, most prostate cancers are related to testosterone. Um, it's a hormone-based cancer, typically, um, at least the most common form. And so because of that, um, as your testosterone production plummets after vaginoplasty um, from doing the orchiectomy or removing the testicles, um, not to mention taking all the testosterone blockers and things like that, um, you know, preoperatively um, throughout the process, um, that all is very risk reducing when it comes to prostate cancer because you don't have that hormone stimulation um, that often causes prostate cancer. Um, but the other side of that um, is you still need to undergo um, screenings um, for prostate cancer if there were to be a um, there's no data or literature on this, but if there were, if you were to develop a prostate cancer after vaginoplasty, um, the reality is it would probably be more aggressive. Um, and the reason is because that would almost ensure that it's not a hormone dependent cancer. Um, in other words, your testosterone production is gone, right? Um, other than the small amount you get from your adrenal glands, um, which everybody has. Um, and so because of that, if you develop a prostate cancer postoperatively um, after vaginoplasty, um, it's not going to be a hormone-based cancer. Any cancer um, of our reproductive organs um, that are not, uh, that's not hormone-based is typically a more aggressive type of cancer. So it's still very important to do your prostate cancer screenings. Um, but overall, is it less likely that you develop prostate cancer? Absolutely. Um, but if it happened, it would be more aggressive, so you should still do your screening. How soon after surgery can I begin to stimulate my clitoris? Um, my old saying comes into play here, which is if it hurts, don't do it. Um, so uh, for clitoral stimulation, um, as long as uh, you're being cognizant of 
um, you know, fresh incisions, wound, bacteria, infections, things like that, um, then you can stimulate your clitoris whenever you feel comfortable. Um, typically, most of my patients have a good sensation um, immediately after vaginoplasty, especially um, at the level of the clitoris. Um, so as long as you're comfortable doing it and as long as it's not hurting, then um, I always say go for it. Um, is it possible for the vaginal cavity to tear during sex? Um, the only way the vaginal cavity would tear during sex would be if you were participating in penetrative intercourse before you were released to do so. In other words, before that 12 week mark or three month mark. Um, after that, the graft um, from the scrotum that's deep in the canal, that's all healed in um, very well, as well as the flap. So all that lining of the vaginal canal um, is very well healed by 12 months. Um, and keep in mind, it's not, you know, flapping out in the breeze. It's surrounded by muscles and soft tissue and other structures and organs and pelvic bones. Um, so I have never had a patient tear um, after intercourse, after penetrative intercourse, after vaginoplasty. Um, I have yet to see that, um, but as long as you're following the guidelines that your surgeon provides as far as the timing on that, I, I, that shouldn't be um, an issue at all um, after intercourse. Is it possible to produce natural vaginal lubricant after surgery? So for, again, the, what's lining the vaginal canal is skin. So if you look at your arm, because your arm is skin, right? Um, your arm doesn't produce uh, any, um, any mucus or any fluid um, that comes from your arm other than just like sweat glands. Um, and so um, this is the same tissue, keep in mind, that's lining the vaginal canal. So no, it does not produce lubrication. Um, and in fact, ultimately, the one stage penile inversion vaginoplasty, which is the, you know, the main thing we're talking about, the rest of it we to please from salvage procedures, um, is, is a fantastic operation. And the fact that it's all kind of done in one step, it's you know, about three hours, um, it's a two-day hospital stay. Um, we're kind of functioning as reverse embryologists, meaning we're converting structures that would have become that structure um, had the fetus, when they were in their mom's uterus growing, been exposed to different hormones. Um, and so it's a very functional operation. Patients have great sensation afterwards. Um, and so overall, it's, it's a fantastic operation. The only two downsides um, of this particular operation are number one, you have to dilate like we talked about previously, um, so that you don't lose your vaginal canal. Um, although, again, that gets less and less as time goes on, um, but you do have some component of dilations um, for life. Um, and then the other is that lubrication. You're not gonna produce lubrication um, from the vaginal canal since it's not lined with the mucosa, it's lined with skin, like the skin on your arm. Um, so you will need to use a um, water-based lubricant um, anytime you're uh, dilating or doing any type of penetrative activity um, within the vaginal canal. Um, and I will also stress that it should be water-based lubricant and not silicone-based lubricant. Um, silicone-based lubricant, although it feels great, um, it's, it's not easily um, cleaned out um, of the vaginal canal, because remember this is a blind pouch and it's lined with skin. Um, so if you imagine, say, um, skin exfoliates, right? So um, the dead skin cells, as they come to the surface, they slough off, um, which is why we use um, like exfoliants on our face. That's why we use loofahs in the shower to kind of brush off the dead skin cells. So if you can imagine, that skin's lining your vaginal canal. So you have these dead skin cells that need to go somewhere, and then you're putting silicone-based lubricant up there, which is very water resistant. It's very difficult to clean off of anything, um, much less a, um, you know, a vaginal canal. Um, and so then that can, you know, kind of build up over time. Um, so, um, so that's why um, the, we always recommend water-based lubricants only. Um, but yes, I guess to answer the question, you are um, going to need to use water-based lubricants um, after surgery if you're doing a one-stage penile inversion vaginoplasty. Um, if you're doing anything that involves a mucosa, such as colon vaginoplasty, small bowel vagin vaginoplasty, peritoneum, things like that, those all produce fluid on their own and don't necessitate dilations and, and uh, lubrication always. Um, but um, again, those are more invasive and more for salvage procedures. So um, just in general, um, yes, for vaginoplasty, always use water-based lubricant for anything that you may be doing. 
do I need to have gynecological exams after surgery? Um, yes and no. So um, there's not a um, specific um, reason or indication um, for gynecological exams after surgery from the standpoint of um, you're not doing pap smears. Um, you can, but you don't have to, um, to do pap smears, um, to look for cervical cancer and things like that because there's no cervix. Um, however, um, gynecological exams are really helpful um, after surgery for several reasons. Um, they're a great resource um, for um, discussing uh, sexual relations and intercourse after vaginoplasty, um, if you're having any complications or any difficulty with your canal or um, you know any any issues of that nature, um, their uh, gynecologists are fantastic at um, you know doing speculum exams to look at the canal, see if there's any issues going on. Um, if uh, some patients are having you know discomfort during intercourse or anything like that, um, you know sometimes there's issues with the the pelvic floor muscles, um, and they have uh, great networks for pelvic floor therapists and things like that. Um, that they can kind of plug you in with um, long term. So um, I wouldn't say you have to have gynecological, gynecological exams after surgery, um, but I think gynecologists are a great resource and very helpful um, after surgery, regardless of you know the necessity, medical necessity of um, you know the thing, a lot of the, the things that you know cis females you know see gynecologists for, like doing you know pap smears and things. Um, but I think they're a great resource, and I think um, having a uh, gynecologist um, in your life is a good thing. Um, what kind of erotic sensation will I have? So the other good thing about this operation is the sensation is usually fantastic. Um, the so the uh, the dorsal neurovascular bundle, which is a really fancy word for meaning um, the uh, the nerves, arteries, and veins. Um, that are supplying the sensation and blood supply, the majority of it, to the, uh, the tip of the penis. So in other words, the glands of the penis. Okay, those are all preserved during this operation. And that's what we're creating the clitoris from. Um, and it's actually to the point where we don't even dissect out um, the neurovascular bundle or those nerves, arteries, and veins. We don't even look at them. We don't even see them during the operation because we're protecting them that much um, to make sure there's not any type of you know cautery injury or stretch injury or anything to that um, to that area. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take the glands um, or the head of the penis and we're going to make a little small clitoris and we're going to turn it into that and we're going to leave it all attached to those same nerve arteries and veins that were there previously but with less surface area um, and then we're going to tack it down um, on your pubic bone and put it in the right spot so that's in good anatomical position um, and so i have not had um, unless patients aren't coming forward about it i have not had any patient ever complain about sensation after vaginoplasty it's usually fantastic um, for um, sensation within the canal, um, that's another question I get asked. Um, so the canal, it's, it's an opening, right, that we're creating between other structures and we're lining it with skin. Um, so um, it is going to take time um, for nerves, the peripheral nerves, to regenerate and provide sensation into the canal. Um, once you get that, then uh, you will definitely have like tactile sensation, which means the sensation of touch. Um, you know, pressure, things like that, um, are all uh, regenerated from the peripheral nerves that grow into the um, canal after it's lined with skin. Um, and so, but for erotic, sen erotic sensation afterwards, um, there's no receptor that's like an erogenous receptor or an erotic receptor. Um, that's all very psychological. Um, there are like, you know, temperature receptors, there's pressure receptors, there's, you know, touch receptors, all those things um, exist, right? But erogenous receptors are not, not an anatomical thing. It's all also very coupled and um, paired with your, your psyche. Um, and so to say you're going to have erogenous sensation or erotic sensation within the vaginal canal, I mean, 
most likely most of my patients seem to um, but that's also very um, you know dependent on each individual person and and how they perceive pleasure um, so so yes nine months to a year out to get that kind of um, that sensation of touch and pressure and temperature and things like that into the canal um, where we operate for the clitoris um, usually fantastic out of the gate um, every once in a while it you know can get kind of nerve can just get kind of irritated just from the surrounding inflammation and sweat and stress of surgery um, and so it may take a little bit to wake up but I haven't had any issues otherwise uh, what is a zero depth vaginoplasty um, I'm glad somebody asked this because a zero depth vaginoplasty um, some patients actually have kind of surprised me they don't really know what a zero depth vaginoplasty is um, and it's a great option for patients that have no interest in penetrative intercourse or having a canal. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, what a zero depth vaginoplasty is, is it's the almost the exact same thing that we're doing with the full one stage penile inversion vaginoplasty with the exception of um, the, the canal that we're creating between the rectum below, urethra and bladder above, um, that's 12 to 15 centimeters and lined with skin, that's the only piece of that operation that's not happening. Um, so everything else is there. So you still have the clitoris, you have the, you know, the clitoral prefuse or the hood, um, you have the labia minor, you have the labia majora. So your whole external vulva looks the exact same um, as a cis female or a, you know, or a, you know, a full one stage female conversion vaginoplasty patient. And then what I do um, is I actually uh, take the skin um, from the, you know, most of it's gone and excised because we don't need it. Um, but from the shaft of the penis, whatever um, a few centimeters worth of skin from that um, remains, um, it's it's sutured together and then still inverted and tacked into um, your body, kind of underneath where your urethral uh, bulb is. And the reason that I do that is because then externally it still looks like a normal vaginal canal. Um, if you know obviously it's a blind ending it doesn't go anywhere and it's not truly a full vaginal canal um, but externally it looks identical um, and so it's a great option for patients who have no interest in having a vaginal canal um, and the reason is because um, if you really think about this procedure um, the main scary big complications that can happen with this procedure all relate to creating that vaginal canal um, that's you know millimeters away from all those very important structures um, so if you take that kind of out of it, um, you're really mitigating all that risk um, for uh, rectal injuries, you know, rectovaginal fistulas, you know, bladder injuries, bladder neck injuries, urethral injuries. You know, again, I've been fortunate I haven't had those complications even with the full vaginoplasty, but they can happen. Um, and for a zero depth vaginoplasty, that's really not even on the table. Um, the other benefit is you don't have to worry about lubrication because you're not using a vaginal canal. You don't have to worry about dilations because there's no canal to keep open. And then on top of it, um, uh, it's an outpatient procedure. Um, the, the, um, for the one stage penile inversion vaginoplasty, um, those patients, at least mine, um, and I think most of my partners, they stay in the hospital for two nights um, just, you know, to make sure pain's controlled, they're tolerating food, they're able to walk around, they know how to take care of their catheter, um, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, for a zero depth vaginoplasty, it's an outpatient operation. Um, so it is, um, so it's uh, a little bit quicker, um, with a little bit less risk, um, and still looks externally the same. Um, so um, for anybody who isn't interested um, in, in the full procedure, um, that's definitely an option. So, um, are there any specific medical condition circumstances that would disqualify me from being a candidate for vaginoplasty? Um, that's a complicated question. Um, so, I have not had um, I have not had a vaginoplasty patient or consultation that I have. Um, you know, turned away and not operated on. Um, but that being said, that's where the um, entire, um, you know, pre-op conversation and consult and things like that come into play. Um, and why it's really important that you express to your surgeon what your medical conditions are, you know, what medicines you take, who your primary care doctors are, who manage those medical complications. Um, because the most important thing for us is that we wanna make sure you're safe to have surgery. Um, 
that's I know that's the most important thing obviously um, and one of the main ones that comes into play is a uh, body mass index or your weight in other words your BMI um, so body mass index um, is a uh, measure of that takes into account both your height and your weight um, to determine um, you know whether you're you know, classified as overweight, obese, you know, underweight, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so a BMI or body mass index of 35 is what we prefer for all patients that we operate on, um, just because anything over 35 is getting to the obesity range. Um, uh, patients with obesity um, have a much higher risk for postoperative complications. Um, especially with wound healing complications, um, post-operative pneumonia, blood clots, um, and things of that nature. And so um, the more weight loss you can achieve prior to surgery, um, the better, um, just from an overall health standpoint and also from a surgery recovery standpoint. Um, so that's kind of situation on um, BMI. I haven't, um, I've certainly done vaginoplasties on patients that are well over 35 um, as their BMI, but it just, it doesn't come without risk. Um, so as long as the patient, um, you know, kind of understands, you know, where we're at and, and um, you know, what things we need to watch for and be cognizant of and what risk they're willing to accept in order to undergo surgery. Um, and that's kind of how we handle that. But yeah, the, if you can get your BMI under 35, you're going to just have a much smoother course um, after, after surgery. Um, in addition to that, other medical problems um, we need to be aware of that are really important um, would be um, like things like diabetes, again, big, big, huge problem with like wound healing issues and postoperative complications, not to mention we need to be able to manage your, um, your blood sugars and stuff like that within the perioperative period. When the body's under stress um, from surgery, um, you know, things change, things are different, and we need to be able to monitor that and manipulate it. Um, the um, other thing that comes to mind is uh, smoking. Um, smokers or any nicotine product, because I've also had patients come um, say, oh, I've stopped smoking, I've stopped smoking, I'm ready for surgery, it's, I've been, I haven't smoked for a month, and then I look and they have like, a huge nicotine patch on their arm or something. Um, so still congratulations, because that's still better than smoking. But, um, but the nicotine is actually the problem. Um, in this instance. So um, nicotine is a very potent vasoconstrictor, which means it takes your blood vessels, which are a tube that's carrying blood, oxygen, nutrients, and all that stuff um, throughout your entire body and also to your surgical wounds. Um, anytime you have nicotine, this is what it does to your blood vessels. It completely clamps them down. Um, and so patients with um, you know, who have nicotine products on board after surgery, whether it be cigarettes, whether it be a vape pen, whether it be nicotine lozenges, gum, patches, any of that, the nicotine is the issue. Um, and um, I've seen some really devastating complications um, with wound healing and things like that, especially after bottom surgeries, because um, it's a big operation um, with a lot of tissue rearrangement that we're asking your body to heal. Um, and if you're not letting your body supply that area with the proper nutrients and, and things it needs in order to heal that area, you're not gonna get a good result. Um, and so we do um, require that all our patients be off nicotine at least one to two months before surgery and at least a month after surgery um, so that they can have a good cosmetic result and be happy. Um, other than that, um, bleeding disorders are very, very important. Um, patients with like von Willebrand's disease or any of those kind of genetic bleeding or clotting disorders, those are all very, very important to tell your surgeon. Um, those can um, alter things and uh, make the surgery more or less dangerous depending on um, what it is and how we need to manage it around the time of surgery. Um, collagen vascular disorders, abdominals, all those kinds of, uh, of um, you know, medical conditions um, all can affect and alter your surgical outcome um, and put you at risk, um, you know, when you're in the operating room and after. Um, and so that's why it's really important um, to discuss that with your surgeon. Uh, HIV is another one. Um, we always request uh, that we have records from your infectious disease specialist um, so that we know what your uh, CD4 count is, your viral load, things like that, because we want to make sure. Um, I've, I've done vaginoplasties for several patients with HIV, but I just want to make sure that you're in a good, everything's under control, everything's in a, in a good spot so that when I do your surgery, you're going to have a good, a 
the result and a good outcome and be able to heal um, all those surgical wounds properly. Um, I had another one and it's gone, dang it. Um, uh, but yeah, so ultimately I haven't, I haven't turned anybody away um, for a medical problem, um, but I sometimes require further information, you know, especially of cardiac problems, you know, things like that, arrhythmias, you know, heart conditions, um, you know, stuff like that. You know, we just need to make sure all of our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed um, before we, you know, go to the operating room so we can make sure what we're doing is safe. Um, and then uh, this question, can I do vaginoplasty, facial feminization, facial feminization surgery and breast augmentation at the same time? Um, for facial feminization, the answer is no. Um, that's the short answer. Um, if it's really minimal amount of stuff, because when you talk about facial feminization, my partner, Dr. Rodriguez, and then Dr. Crane here in Austin could, could speak about this for days, um, but it, it really is many different procedures, um, and it just kind of depends on what constellation of you know, procedures that you need or want um, or um, feel are necessary, um, you know, based on your facial structure. Um, and so that can be anywhere from a three hour operation to a 10 hour operation, depending on what all is being done. Um, so just in general, um, combining vaginoplasty with facial feminization, um, in our mind isn't the best combo. Um, that's a lot for your body to go through. Um, you really, it's better to focus on one or the other. And we don't really care if you do one first or the other first. That really is irrelevant um, in this situation. So whichever one is creating more dysphoria um, for you, that's the one I would do first. Um, but I would not recommend doing those two together. Um, now, breast augmentation, that's a different story. We routinely do breast augmentation at the same time as facial feminization, and we routinely do breast augmentation at the same time as vaginoplasty. Um, so both, if you kind of think of it as, you know, vaginoplasty and facial feminization, those are kind of the big, you know, the bigger operations that are more time consuming and that require you to undergo a much bigger recovery um, process. I would leave those separate. Um, and then breast augmentation, um, that's kind of easily added on um, to one or the other, depending on, you know, whatever are doing first or what your needs are so um okay i think that's all the questions i have um so yeah thank you for uh joining us today and um, if you have any other um you know any further questions on uh, vaginoplasty or any other type of transgender surgery um you can uh, uh be sure to you can leave comments uh here on this thread um and we can respond to you you can always uh you know call us on the phone email us um or schedule a consultation or whatever